Undoubtedly one of our rarest bats, the Greater Horseshoe is certainly one of our largest and most impressive species. It's mostly confined to South Wales and the West Country, and it's also one of the Mendip Hills National Landscape's champion species. These are a small select suite of eight key species which thrive in quality habitats. These canaries in a coal mine are a good measure of environmental conditions and help by both driving conservation initiatives and raising awareness of the habitats in which they live. Britain's two species of horseshoe bats are immediately recognisable by their horseshoe-shaped flap of skin on their face, which together with the additional connecting tissue forms the nose leaf. The bats use this unique structure for echolocation. Both horseshoe bats prefer to hang in their roost of choice, often wrapping their wings tightly around their bodies. However, the greater is more substantial than its lesser cousin, and when hanging, it's considered about the size of a small pear. Greater horseshoes often emerge from their roost around 30 minutes after dusk, before commuting to pastures and woodland edge close by for a night's foraging. They have a distinctive slow and fluttering flight, with short glides, and their broad wings give them considerable manoeuvrability. Paul Kennedy is a professional ecologist and member of the Somerset Bat Group. So greater horseshoes need uh, a lot of decent roost sites, so caves, big old barns, big old buildings that they can roost in, and decent connectivity across the landscape, so preferably unmanaged hedgerows that link up with really good foraging habitat, which is their priority is cattle, graze pasture. Uh, lots of species rich grasslands, we get lots of invertebrates. So at the start of the year the bats are eating a lot of dung beetles uh, and in May there's a super abundance of cockchafers which are a big meal for a greater horseshoe bat. Um, they then switch during the period when they've got young they switch to the larger moths like yellow underwing which are super abundant in the middle of summer and then slowly throughout the year the number of moths declines and they start switching to things like crane flies uh, and the smaller dung flies. They generally hibernate from November through to March, uh, depending on the weather. Um, they're using a lot of the caves to hibernate in, so preferably undisturbed sites where the temperature is fairly constant and there's nice humidity. So they use lots of different sites at different times of the year. Sometimes where they're breeding is also the same site where they hibernate, but they might use different aspects of the site that they're in. So they might use a nice warm spot for breeding and a much cooler spot within the same area for hibernating. Greater horseshoes have declined quite significantly across the 20th century. Uh, we lost about 90% of the population, we think, um, mostly due to things like woodworm treatments, disturbance, uh, and development, uh, changes in farming practices. We know we've lost a lot of our invertebrate populations, particularly the larger species that greater horseshoes specialize in. Uh, and this is probably due to a lot of modern farming methods with modern wormers in the cattle and they often kill off a lot of the dung beetles so there's sometimes not a lot left for the graters to eat. We think the population is generally around 12,000. I mean they're quite widespread mostly around the southwest but they do occur as far north as North Wales um, but the middle population is about 12,000. Mendip Hills are an essential core component of the Greater Horseshoe population in the UK. Uh, there's lots of nice habitat, species-rich grassland, lots of invertebrate prey and decent connectivity between some of the core roosting sites. And what are the main issues adversely impacting Greater Horseshoe bats? So light pollution is something that's been growing since uh, the middle of the 20th century and this is something that negatively impacts on bats. It obviously draws a lot of invertebrates out of the landscape to the lights and the bats are quite light averse, so they don't like going into areas where there are lots of light spill. So they avoid those areas. And the Mendip Hills is great because large proportions of it are absolutely pitch black and this is perfect for bats. As far as we're aware at the moment, the bats across the Mendip Hills are slowly increasing in number. We know from studies that were done over 20 years ago, there was a f as few as about 100 bats in Cheddar Caves. Uh, and now we're up to maybe about 800 in summer, we think. They're really hard to count and they're spreading out across the landscape. 
into all the different sites, so it's, it's hard to get a true estimate, but they do seem to be coming back slowly but surely. So the important things that landowners can do is to manage their landscape in a way that benefits insects. And this is a fundamental part of what the greater horseshoes need. So they're really good for organic pasture. Organic ca cattle pasture is some of the best habitat for graters, but nice mixed scrub and bushy hedgerows and woodland are all key uh, areas for greater horseshoes. Sometimes uh, there's a balance to be gained between cavers and bats and we do have good relationships with cavers across Mendip who avoid the key periods of time that graters are using some of the caves. Uh, but now that their population is expanding slightly, they're starting to move into caves where they haven't been seen for many years. So it's important that cavers avoid the main periods which are of most disturbance to bats during the breeding periods and especially during the hibernation periods which is when the caves are most important. The Greater Horseshoe breeding period runs from May to September. So it's really important to avoid disturbance over winter. These bats have built up their fat reserves during the summer to eke out the, what they've got left over winter to get through to the following spring. Uh, and during the winter, if they're disturbed, they can wake up and burn up their fat reserves and it might mean that they don't survive. So how can you ensure the Mendips continue as a stronghold for surely one of Britain's most charismatic bats? Extensions and conversions should include spaces for bats and sensitive lighting. Putting up bat boxes will also help all species. And finally, get involved in monitoring and recording bat species by joining a local bat group and attending bat walks. I really love greater horseshoes. I mean, they're such a huge enigmatic bat and the fact that they're starting to spread back into their old haunts means we're doing something right. And it's always a great surprise when you're out and about with a, a little de detector and you get a greater horseshoe warbling past you. You don't, often don't see them, but they're there flying around your head for all you know. Uh, and they're, they're huge and beautiful and I love them. <laughs>